Amen. Yes, you may be seated. Good morning. Good to see everybody today. If we haven't met, my name is Adam. I'm the associate pastor. Our lead pastor, Kyle, is preaching at our Columbus campus this morning. But uh, good to see all of you. Everybody, everybody awake, feeling good after losing an hour last night? Everybody good? Everybody with us? Hey, if you need to take a nap, you know, if that's what you need, go ahead, I guess. That's fine. Um, but uh, I, I, we're, we're just continuing our series this morning. Let me ask you a question, though. Um, if I say the phrase, bold, specific prayer, what comes to your mind? Is there a prayer that you've prayed or that you've experienced that was just kind of a bold, specific prayer? I was thinking about that this week, and two things came to mind. Uh, one is, years ago, I dated a girl, and my mom, who's sitting right here, will tell you, to this day, she'll say, I prayed that girl right out of his life. <laughs> All right? That's a pretty bold, specific prayer. Uh, some of you may be praying that right now for your own kids. I don't know. I just hope my in-laws aren't praying that prayer. You know what, I'm, you know what I mean? Um, but uh, that, that was a pretty bold, specific prayer. Uh, but then I also remember right after we got to the church over in Mountain Grove, Missouri, where we were at before we came here, um, the church was really struggling at the time. We needed some momentum. We needed some more leaders and workers. And so um, you know, we, we wanted to pray that God would send us some good, solid families that could, could you know, roll their sleeves up and help us. But we also knew that our mission as a church was to reach people who don't know Jesus. And so I, I challenged our church at the time. I said, I said, how about if we pray for one solid worker family and one seeker family by such and such date? We even put a date on it, right? Talk about a bold, specific prayer. And uh, so one worker family, one, uh, one seeker family by, I don't know, Easter, Memorial Day, whatever it was, I don't remember. And do you know God sent on the same Sunday one worker family and one seeker family? And you want to know what Sunday he sent them on? The Sunday after the deadline we set. <laughs> and I remember joking at the time, it's almost like God was saying, I'm going to answer this bold, specific prayer but I'm going to give it to you the Sunday after your deadline just to remind you we operate on my timing, not yours, right? <laughs> right? So bold, specific prayers. As we continue this series, Questions Jesus Asked, we're going to talk about praying bold, specific prayers this morning. So in Matthew 20, this is uh, not long before Jesus uh, would, would be arrested and crucified. He's nearing the end of his ministry, the end of his earthly time uh, here. And so we, we come across this. In Matthew 20, we find this one short little story. It says, as Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside, and when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. The crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet, but they shouted all the louder, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus stopped and he called them, read it with me, what do you want me to do for you, he asked. What do you want me to do for you? That can be a very helpful question. You know, it, that can also sound like, how can I help? Um, you know, how can I make things better? Jesus phrases it, what can, I, you know, what can I do for you? What do you want me to do for you? I, you know, Sarah and I, I've shared this before. It took Sarah and I a long time to figure out that when one of us has had a bad day and comes home grumpy and is kind of barking at everybody else in the house, it's really not helpful to bark back. <laughs> really? Come on, we've all done that. When in the history of being grumpy has anybody ever stopped being grumpy because somebody barked back? And it took us a long time to figure out when one of us comes home in a bad mood, don't, don't snap back. Just ask, how can I help? What can I do? How can I make the evening go better? Swallow that urge to bite back or to bark back and just say, how can... Some of you are laughing and giggling because you know exactly... You probably... You might have done that yesterday. <laughs> Next time somebody's being a jerk, resist the urge to be a jerk in return and just ask one of those questions. Ask this question. What, what do you want me to do for you? How, what can I do? How can I help? Here, Jesus asked this question not to somebody who's being a jerk, but to two men who have a great need in their lives, the need to see. They were blind. And I wonder if Jesus were to ask that question of us today in the church. 
I kind of feel like our answer might be something like, well, God, I just want your will to be done. God, I just want what you think is best. Now, there's nothing wrong with that prayer, right? That's not a wrong prayer to pray at all. But I wonder sometimes, does God want us to be more specific? What do you want? He said, what do you want me to do for you? In fact, if we read on, here's here's what they answer. That's the question, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, they answered, we want our sight. We want to see. And Jesus rebuked them for not praying for his will to be done. No, it says Jesus had compassion on them. And he touched their eyes and immediately they received their sight and they followed him. They prayed a bold, specific prayer. Jesus asked a question, and these guys had the boldness, had the audacity, had the nerve to actually tell him. We want to see. That's what we want. I'm not going to ask. Of course you have. You know the frustration when you ask somebody what they want and they won't tell you? I've always thought if I ever open a restaurant, I'm going to call it, I don't care. (laughs) Where do you want to eat tonight? I don't care. Good, it's settled. I'd be a millionaire in six months just from the couples who would show up. (laughs) Now, sometimes people really don't care. But you know how sometimes you ask somebody, what do you want? And you know they have an answer, but they won't tell you. I wonder if God is ever saying to us, Tell me what you want. I love you. Tell me what you want. Jesus asked these men what they wanted, and they told him, and they received what they asked for. Now, a little disclaimer. There's a theology out there that we sometimes refer to as name it and claim it theology. This theology teaches that if I want or need something, then all I have to do is tell God about it, and if I have enough faith, I'll get it. And if I don't get it, well, there must be something wrong with my faith. Can I just say that is a false teaching that has no doubt done more harm than good. I'm not talking about name it and claim it today. Make no mistake about that. And we just finished our study on on the Lord's Prayer. Remember how the Lord's Prayer starts. Our Father, who is in heaven, holy is your name. In other words, you're God, I'm not. That's how the Lord's Prayer starts. God is not a genie in the bottle. He's not Santa Claus. He is the sovereign God of the universe. And he doesn't owe me anything. Can Can we get that right? God doesn't owe me anything. He doesn't owe you anything. He is not obligated to any of us. He chooses to bless us out of his love and his grace and his mercy. But he is not obligated to give me what I want just because I prayed it and had enough faith. So, so let's just, let's get that straight this morning. But having said that, my fear is that our reaction to this false teaching, in that reaction, we've gone too far in the opposite direction, and I fear that too often we don't pray boldly and specifically enough that we get so focused on, well, God, just, just, I just want your will to be done. Well, of course we want God's will to be done, but sometimes God's asking, what do you want me to do for you? Tell me what you want. I was thinking, why is that? Why do we so often not pray boldly and specifically? Here's a a few reasons for that that I think. One, we're afraid if it's not answered, somebody may turn against God. A lot of us probably know somebody, maybe even somebody in this room or somebody watching online fits that. We can't dismiss that completely. Or maybe we think we don't want to trample on the sovereignty of God. He is sovereign. Well, that's that's true. We might offend God by telling him what to do. Here's the the thing. Uh, There's probably just enough truth in those, just enough legitimacy in those to be dangerous. Because look at these verses. 
Jesus said, you may ask me for anything in my name and I'll do it. He says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. And then James says, you know what? You don't have because you don't ask God. Now, yes, those are verses that are often used by the name it and claim it crowd. And while they are often taken out of context and misused, they're there. We can't ignore them. So what do we do with them? How do we pray boldly and specifically while also remembering who we are and who God is, that he is our Father in heaven whose name is holy? How do we do that? Well, I have a crazy, insane idea. I mean, this is crazy. Nobody's ever thought of this before. This is a crazy idea. How about we look at how Jesus did it? Whoa, how about that? Let's look at how Jesus did it. In Matthew 26, if you've been around the church any length of time, you, you know this story. In fact, we talk about it up here from this platform quite often because it's such a powerful, important story in the Gospels. Jesus is just, he's moments away from his arrest. He's hours away from his crucifixion. And he's in this place called the Garden of Gethsemane. He's there with some of his disciples. He says, you guys pray. And then it says that he goes on a little bit farther and he bowed down with his face to the ground and he prayed, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Now, usually in this, in this story, we focus on the second part, right? Not my will, but yours be done. But let's just camp out on the first part for a second. Jesus' whole mission was to come to die for our sins. And moments before his arrest, hours before that crucifixion, he is praying, God, if there's any other way, will you take this cup of suffering from me? God, I don't want to go through this. Would you take this away? That is a bold, specific prayer, folks. And Jesus is praying it. Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus, our Savior, is pouring his heart out to God with the most honest prayer you can imagine. God, if there's any way for me not to have to do this, this was the whole reason I came, but if there's any way for me to avoid this suffering, would you take it from me? Yet, not my will but yours be done. Before the prayer, not my will but yours be done, there was a very bold, specific request. God, if there's any other way to do this, if there's any other way to do this. See, Jesus models for us. We can pray bold, specific prayers, but we pray them with a surrendered heart. We can pray bold, specific prayers, but we pray them with a surrendered heart. Now you might say, well, I can't help but notice that God didn't answer that prayer, and thank God he didn't, right? Or we would all still be lost and stuck in our sin. But you also notice that Jesus didn't turn on God when God didn't answer that prayer. That's because his heart wasn't just surrendered to God in that moment. Jesus lived a surrendered life far long before he ever got to this moment. You see, if we're not careful, we'll, we'll kind of hold God off to a side so we can pursue our own agenda, pursue our own thing. And then when we want or need something, then we turn to him and say, oh, by the way, God, uh, can you give me this? And then if we're not careful, we're, we get angry with him when, when that prayer isn't answered. When all along, we've been holding him off to the side anyway. No, Jesus lived his life and surrender to him so that when he came to this moment in the garden, that prayer came naturally. That prayer of surrender came naturally because that's how he lived his life, surrendered to the Father. See, here's, here's a truth today. With a surrendered heart, my relationship with God is not based on what he can do for me. It's rooted in who he is. With a surrendered heart, my relationship with God is not based on what he can do for me. It's rooted in who he is. It's rooted in his faithfulness, his love, his grace, his truth. And those things don't change. 
Whether I get all my prayers answered or not, those things don't change. So my relationship with God doesn't have to change if he doesn't answer my prayers the way that I want. Because my relationship with him isn't rooted in these things that I want. It's rooted in who he is. That only comes from a surrendered heart. Folks, that doesn't come naturally to us as human beings. That comes as God's grace and his spirit transforms us as we say, God, you have it all. Everything I am, everything I have, you have it all, God. It's that surrendered heart that keeps us from getting bitter, that keeps us from walking away from God when he answers us with a not yet or a no or sometimes what feels like silence. It's that surrendered heart that helps us trust that God has a perspective that we don't see. I love this verse from Isaiah. Just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. That verse has meant so much to me through so many things over the years. So many things that I didn't understand. God, why did this happen? God, how did you, how did you allow this to happen? I don't understand all this. My ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. God has a perspective that I don't have. And it's a surrendered heart that that allows me to to, to trust that. Again, the Lord's Prayer, our Father who is in heaven. In other words, who has a perspective that I don't see. When I first started out in ministry, I was... um, it was at the height of the Promise Keepers men's group. It was kind of at the height of, of, of their, it was at their peak. And the first Promise Keepers event I went to was at the, the stadium in St. Louis. And, you know, I'm just starting out in ministry, and, and here were these big-name authors and speakers speaking to thousands of men. And I remember just being enthralled by that and saying, I want that. I want to be a sought-after famous author and speaker who speaks to thousands someday, millions. How about it, God? And then different times over the years, I might get invited to speak here, invited to speak there, and I I wouldn't verbalize it, but in the back of my mind, I would think, is is this this the beginning of, of that, God? Then I'd be disappointed when it wouldn't happen. But can I tell you, I look at my life now. I look at the life God's blessed me with. And I look at my boys. Been very few games or activities of theirs I've missed. There have been very few nights when they were little that I missed being able to tuck them in bed. I don't still tuck them in bed. (laughs) They're this big. I mean, very few family dinners at the table I've missed. See, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that by God's grace, I can pray bold, specific prayers. I'm also thankful that by His grace, He doesn't always answer them. Pray bold, specific prayers, folks. But pray them with a heart that is fully surrendered to our Father who is in heaven and whose name is holy. Now, you say, well, what if I, what if I pray something that's just silly? What if I pray something that really is kind of selfish? What, well, do you think God's going to be ashamed of you for praying a silly prayer? No, of course not. Your kids ever ask you, if you have kids, they ever ask you for something silly? Dad, I want a, I want a horse with a purple tail, and I, I don't know. God's not going to be ashamed of you because you asked for something silly. He's not even going to be ashamed of you because you asked for something that really deep down is kind of selfish. But you know what? Here's what happens. As we surrender our hearts to God, 
And as we live a life of surrender to him, he begins to mold and shape our minds and our hearts. In fact, the Bible talks about actually having the mind of Christ. That's what God wants to shape and mold in us. And as we surrender to him and he molds us, begins to give us the mind of Christ and molds our minds and our hearts and even molds our desires, then you know what happens to our bold, specific prayers? They begin to become more focused on his kingdom and less on ours. So pray them. Pray specific prayers. Pray bold prayers. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. Lord, we want to see. That's all we want. We want to see. Now let me ask, let me make one more observation about this. Let me ask one more question. Do you think Jesus knew the answer to the question before he asked it? I'm pretty sure he did. I mean, it had to be pretty obvious. What can I do for you? Hello, we want to see. The truth is the Bible is full of of places where, where God asks questions of people where he clearly already knows the answer. In fact, my favorite place that we see that is in Genesis chapter 3. It's the story of Adam and Eve. They've brought sin into the world, and, and, and it's a terrible, awful, horrible, tragic story. And yet, in the midst of that story, all along, we see fingerprints of God's grace. And the first fingerprint of God's grace is that he goes and seeks them out. He doesn't wait for them to come to him. He seeks them out. But the second fingerprint of God's grace is that the first four things that God speaks to them are questions. Before he lays out any consequences, before he makes any statements to them about what they had done, he asks four questions. And the first question is, where are you? You think he didn't know? Of course he knew. He knew where they were. Why would he ask that question? That's why this is a fingerprint of God's grace. He didn't ask the question because he was looking for information that he didn't already know. He asked the question because questions invite conversation. Questions invite communication. And communication is one of the foundations of a relationship. In other words, even in their sin, even immediately after their sin, God's desire. We've been talking about our desire. We've been talking about our heart. What's God's heart? God's heart is to have a relationship with you and me. Even in our sin, he comes to us. He seeks us out because he wants a relationship with us. And that's, it's that love of God's that makes it possible for us to just be honest with him. I mean, that's really what we're talking about this morning, isn't it? Just be honest with him. What do you want to pray for? Be honest. Be honest with what you want. Be honest with what you're thinking. Be honest with how you're feeling. And tell him. Why do we pray generic, meatless prayers? When he already knows what we want anyway. What are we hiding from him? When we're not honest with him with what we want or what we think or how we feel, when we're not honest with him about those things, he already knows, folks. You think you're hiding it from him? Just be honest. Even if you're angry with him. Even if you are. One of those people I referred to in the beginning that maybe is a little bitter towards him because he didn't answer a prayer a certain way. He already knows you feel that way. So tell him. Put it in words. Say it out loud even. But be honest with him. You know, there are, there are psalms that David wrote David was called a man after God's heart. 
And there are psalms that David wrote that we have in our Bible where he is clearly angry at God. And he's angry at his enemies. There are places where he prays prayers for his, over his enemies that leaves you going, whoa, that's really in the Bible? But you know, by the end of those psalms, he's almost always thanking and praising God. He gets it out. He's honest with God. He says, God, this is what I want. God, this is where my heart is. God, this is what I'm thinking. Even, God, I'm angry with you. But he gets to the end. And he's almost always saying, but God, praise your holy name. If that's you today, and and maybe you're kind of bitter or angry with God over something, maybe he didn't answer a prayer the way that you wanted, first of all, tell him about it. And then before you're done praying, what if you just thank him? If nothing else, what if you just said, God, thank you for letting me vent to you? Let's be honest with God. So, my two, my two goals for this morning, the two things that I, that I want us to walk away from, um, pray boldly and specifically, folks. Dare to pray boldly and specifically, but pray those prayers from a heart that's surrendered to God. God, I'm all yours. In fact, if you're here today and, and, and you've been nursing a bitter heart toward God because he didn't answer a prayer the way that you hoped, what, what if you prayed this prayer today? God, I'm surrendering to you my need to understand. Isn't that really what that boils down to? God, I don't understand why you didn't answer this prayer this way. What if you prayed today, God, I surrender to you my need to understand Thank you for loving me through the bitterness that I've been carrying. And make no mistake, he has continued to love you through the bitterness. He has continued to love you through the anger. Today, I choose to trust you with a surrendered heart. Can we just, can we all of us say that together? God, I'm surrendering to you my need to understand Thank you for loving me through the bitterness I've been carrying. Today, I choose to trust you with a surrendered heart. And if you don't have a relationship with Jesus at all, what does all this mean for you? There's no more bold, specific prayer you can pray. Then God, would you, in your grace, I don't deserve it, but in your grace, would you forgive me of my sins? And show me what it means to follow you. That's a bold, specific prayer you can pray today. And you don't have to worry about whether or not he's going to answer that or not. He's going to answer that. He's going to answer that. Pray bold, specific prayers. And pray them from a surrendered heart. Ask our band to come up. What do you, uh, what do you want to pray this morning? What do you want today? What is on your heart today? Is there a bold, specific prayer that you want to pray today? I want to invite you to do that. Maybe for you, it's that prayer that that we just had up there. If you want to come pray at the altars this morning, come pray. If you'd like to pray with me, be right here on the front row. Be honest with God. Tell them what you want this morning. Tell them what you need. Tell them what you're thinking. Tell them how you're feeling. But pray it with a heart that says, God, you're God and I'm not. My heart, my life, my mind, everything I have is surrendered to you. Would you stand with us this morning?